Uh, hi everyone, Stuart Lancaster here. Um, we are in Paris, or I am in Paris, Phil's in Ireland. Uh, Leaders on Leaders, this is part five, um, which is a culmination of year one, the transition from Leinster to Racing, the lessons learned from going from an Irish environment to a French environment, the challenges of becoming a head coach in a foreign country. Um, and I have finished the season. Um, I have a bit of a off season and we're just about to start pre-season year two. So Fergal and I thought it'd be a good time to wrap up year one uh, with a video <laughs> here and share and share the, the lessons learned. So uh, I hope you enjoyed. Um, Fergal's also got a good question. So we oui. fire away. Oui, Fergal. Ça, ça va, ça va. <laughs> yeah, we. <oui. laughs> uh, sure, it's great to talk to you again. And, uh, you know, I, 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 I was, I took the opportunity to revisit our first uh, podcast there recently and it struck me at the time, looking back or listen, looking back and listening to it, you know, when I asked you about your objectives for the year, they were all around uh, culture and the sense of identity at Racing and and sort of building the intangibles within the group and empowering them more and, you know, getting greater leadership from the group. And very much then the the results were the out, you know, hopefully the hopeful outputs of, of what you were building. Do a self-assessment of your your year so far, just in terms of the intangibles first. So we can talk a bit about the results at the end of the season, but but just you know what what you sort set out to achieve and how far you feel you've got. Yeah, well, obviously when I started, um, I knew that Racing, having played against them with Leinster, um, uh, and Leinster beaten Racing quite comfortably. You know, there was work there was work to do um, on the field and off the field, really. Um, you know, I inherited generally the same squad that had played the previous year, yeah. minus Ben Russell, ironically. <laughs> We'd have been quite handy. Um, but um, uh, so I wanted, obviously, to learn about the culture and the identity, and I wanted to try and develop that. But alongside that, you know, let's be clear, the performance and the on-field um, element of my job was hugely important as well. You know, so developing, you know, a new attacking style, developing a new way of... Um, Defending, developing the integration of new coaches, Freddie Michalak and Dimitri Sazeski and Joe Rococo. So, uh, and working together with the management team to to begin a new project. So, there was lots of moving parts. We we started well, if you remember. You know, we we played three games before the World Cup, and then we had a six week yep. break during the World Cup, um, and then we had a, a decent run um, right the way through to Christmas. We lost. Um, a couple of games along the way. Um, we lost some tight games in Europe. We got the World Cup players back um, and new players. So, see, Khaleesi arrived, Gil Fiku came out from France, Cameron Mocky. And they're all at different levels of like motivation, having either won or lost in you know the international tournament. So, um, there was a lot of moving parts, a lot of moving parts. In terms of the cultural identity piece, we did a lot of work in the that six week break between the first three games and the end of the World Cup. We went away to Spain for a camp, actually. Um, and I do think uh, the the area I wanted to really get to was the um, the importance of training well, um, off field behaviours, um, player ownership, uh, and trying to get the players to take more responsibility both on and off the field to drive the performance. Um, alongside that, talk about what is the identity of Racing. You know, what do we stand for? Who do we represent? Um, and I thought we. Um, we achieved both things, you know. I've had some one to ones at the end of the season, and and now we're getting to the start again. Um, I think all the players feel we've made steps forward, whilst results w were inconsistent throughout the season. Um, uh, I think they made steps forward, and we stayed connected uh, as a group, and we we've we've definitely improved. And um, how you're French, because right? you identified that day one as something which was more than a stone in your shoe but you know it it you you felt it it you couldn't be as effective as you could be until you got a better grasp of the language are you happy where you're at a year in or are you is it slower than you thought or um it's probably it is slow it is slow and that's not through lack of trying yeah um the the job is very uh, big and very consuming and then to then throw in extra French lessons on an evening or whenever. Um, it was difficult at, at times in the season, um, finding the right tutor who could help 
obviously as well was was important um how do i feel now i feel like i understand a lot more so conversationally i can uh i can interact with people i can make myself understood i can listen and understand generally what's going on most of the time but there's a big difference between that and standing in front of a group of 45 players and 20 30 staff and presenting articulately your vision for attack your vision for defense or your um your reflections of a game your review do you know what i mean so and, and and not only that the ability then to communicate effectively to the media to the sponsors to the owner to the president you know all of whom are you know um french speaking without strong strong uh, strong english so you know if you're going into any organization as a new ceo let's call it yeah, um, your ability to communicate and build relationships is fundamental to doing the job well, uh, and I still feel it's it's uh, I, I would love to be fluid by now, but I'm not, and I still feel it's a it's a barrier to being really effective. I think it's worked. You know, I think the players, if you ask the players, they'd be uh, happy um, with the way I communicate, but I'd be unhappy in that I'm not as fluent as I want to be after year one. But generally, when you speak to um, people who've done what I'm trying to do, then I'm about half a course, I think, at the moment. Okay, okay. I, I laugh because if you've ever seen Ron Nogara speak, and he's been there much longer than you, uh, speaking French with, first of all, a very distinct Cork accent, but secondly, um, it's very basic, rudimentary French. Yeah. That he and gets my, and my mind will always be as well. It's such a complex yeah. language. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And just to go towards the end of the season and just to explain the roller coaster probably of your emotions, you went to La Rochelle on the last day, needing to get a bonus point uh, if if uh, Cast were to win away against Bayon. And the word must have got through at some point, Cast were doing their side of the bargain to keep you out of the top six. And I remember following the score online and you looked dead and buried at one stage. And this would have been the first time you hadn't qualified for the, the knockouts for a good number of years. Talk me through, because you really seemed to go to the well at the end of that game and, and get the, the losing bonus point, with, which ultimately got you into the knockouts. Did that give the team a, a real burst of adrenaline or was it a kind of case of, oh, it's another defeat where, where you know, we've nowhere left to go kind of thing? Well, I mean, yeah, it was as you say, we went through a period um, in the Six Nations. We were minus, I don't know, six or seven key players, injuries and whatever else. And... We lost five games on the bounce. I don't know that's, that's right. Yeah, that. we were sucked into like fifth, sixth, seventh place, and the top six qualify for the for the for the playoffs. And we won a we won a couple, lost a couple. Um, elements of inconsistency in performance, as you say, it came down to La Rochelle game away, which is also a very tough place to go and win. Yeah. And we came down to what the seventy fifth minute. We scored a try and kicked a conversion to get within a bonus point. Bear in mind. It's five points rather than seven points uh, yeah. in, in in France, um, and yeah, we scraped in, and uh, it was interesting at the time because whilst it was highly stressful, you know, and there's been a lot of highly stressful uh, events in the year, um, I actually felt at that time more composed and more confident than I had been at m m other times, if I'm being honest, because okay. the preparation we'd done, the work we'd done, the where we'd focused our attention. I knew I could see it paying off in training. I could see a, a, an element of consistency building um, that hadn't been there um, during the course of the season. So um, when we got down there, I was 100% confident. I was reasonably confident we we're going to come away with something. Uh, and we did. Um, so there's a real sense of uh, relief, but also motivation to go into the, the Bordeaux game, um, which was the playoff game. Yeah, um, which is always going to be very difficult in uh, in in their place, um, thirty two thousand fans, um, and so it proved it was a step too far. Um, we were in the game very close till poor discipline let us down. They got a try just before half time, and we came back, but the damage was done in maybe a twenty minute period inside of half time, and so that's how the season ended. Um, yeah. and then what follows is then a um. Uh, a, per a period of like, okay, how do we um, uh, finish this? How do we finish the season? How do we re review it? Um, we've got 18 players leaving. We've got massive players who've been at Racing for 
10, 12 years leaving, you know, so how does that all unfold? So there's a lot of pressure on um, a head coach um, in any organization when you've lost in a, in a playoff game. Um, and this was no exception, you know, me trying to navigate, being respectful to players that were leaving, trying to um, manage um, disappointment, um, trying to give perspective and balance. Uh, so that final few days, you know, uh, was hard. There was, there was an element of um, restructuring and stuff going on. So there were uh, interviews going on and uh, you know, everyone was sort of heading for the holidays, planning for the, you know, I was planning for the next preseason and everything else. So there was a lot of moving parts at the time. Um, I thought we navigated it pretty well. Um, but ultimately, when you analyse it in the cold light of day, you know, we made improvements. Um, but there's a reason why 18 players have left the club, you know, because I felt that we have a smaller squad now, but we have better quality. Um, so I'm hopeful that this season will result in a better outcome. So you've 18 departures, you've nine new players in, and some of them are, you know, the, the own Farrells of this world. Yeah. Um, does this, in a sense, such, that's and that's a pretty big turnover for, for a single year. Does that put the project backwards a little bit while you try then to, again, for the second year running, set the objectives, the culture you're trying to create because some a lot of these haven't heard it before. Uh no, I don't think it does. I think I think I think in some ways, you know, when you're coming new to an organization, you're obviously gonna you're gonna spend your hundred days listening and learning about what to do and then you're gonna implement your changes, which is essentially, you know, what I did. Um and now we're on to year two. You know, when I think back to this time last year, we were bringing in new everything everything was new. Yeah. Whereas, you know, yes, 18 players have left, but there's still a core of 30 players that have I've worked with now for a year. There's a whole uh, consistency in the in the management team, the doctors, the physios, the co the coaches. So we've we've we'll be able to pick up where we left off and hit the ground running in a far more effective way than we did in in year one. You know, so um, I remember looking at um, Ugo Mort. So Toulouse had an amazing season, for example. This yes, year. They, they did the double. They smashed Bordeaux in the final of the top 14. Obviously, they beat Leinster in the European Cup final, so did the double. Uh, and I was looking at uh, Ugo Moller's record, who was the who was the current head coach. He, uh, I think, joined in 2016. I think they came like 12th, 9th, 4th, didn't qualify for Europe, um, and then ultimately got to the top in year four of his time. Uh, Leinster beaten in a couple of you know European Cup semifinals. So... And obviously now everyone goes, go, what amazing team to lose are. But like, if you go Five back to, years in the making. Yeah, yeah. 2016, 2017, 2018, 2019. Because the reality of the top 14 is that um, there's a salary cap, which is um, uh, e equal for everyone. Yeah. Uh, it's adhered to. And you've got some very, very good players in lots of very good teams, you know, who've got strong identity, strong culture, strong coaching. And the challenge of the top 14 as well is with the relegation dynamic you've got no easy games you know so if you look at the league table um even though Toulouse won the league they still lost nine games yes um if you look at uh you know who came below us Montpellier got into a relegation playoff fight against a pro de team and I think you know they they might have lost I don't know I'm talking about 15 15 maybe but they, they still won 11 games you know yeah um so it's very very tough competition um and uh, uh the uh the departure of 18 players sounds dramatic but i think it's going to um help us because we've got more quality you've talked before about uh the clock and where a team is on the clock uh in terms of its stage of development can you give me a sense of where you feel the clock was when you arrived and and where you think you've moved the clock to now and you might explain interesting, to interesting. That, that 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 um performance clock uh analogy is is an exercise I'm doing with the players next week in preseason. Ah. Um because I want them to read the article about it. And basically what um the article Are you do, says, doing it for them individually, Stuart? No, 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 we're gonna do it as, as, a, 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 team. A, as a team. We're gonna do it as a team. Yeah. And I'm gonna ask them to ask ask them to understand do they what do they understand by the concept? Where do you think we are on the clock? Um, what are the key points they've taken from the principle. So just for those listening, like the performance clock is a 
is uh, an analogy of like where a team is in its life cycle. So a team at 12 o'clock is a team at its peak, a team at six o'clock is a team at its lowest point, and we're all working around this clock. And, and basically it says in high performance, high performance sport, and I'm sure business as well, you need to make change before change is necessary. Um, yeah. And I think I think that um, uh, at Racing, you know, there was a lot of great work done, great foundations, um, but there needed to be change um, and effective change. Hence, you know, changing coaches, changing players, et cetera, et cetera. So um, uh, I would say we are eight o'clock, nine o'clock. Um, we're on yeah. the up. Um, we are, we've got a, a fair way to go to be where where Leinster were when I left um, in terms of consistency and quality. Um, uh, but I do think that the changes that we've made, we've tried to retain, you know, the culture. Um, but ultimately, if if you retain the culture and the players who've um, always been at the club for ten years or whatever, then you know you're always going to get the same outcome. So it's it's recognizing that change is important and building on the strengths. For example, we brought in a a new academy uh, manager um, who's from a different club. You know, we've got people like Owen Farrell coming in. We've got players from South Africa coming in. Um, we've got um, some players from uh, the French national team coming into the team. So we've got this really eclectic mix of, you know, different nationalities and personalities. Um, and I think those changes are going to be good for Racing in the long term. Um, uh, obviously, what I need to do is to make sure that if we're turning a ship around, like we're, we keep going in the in the upward direction. Um, so, yeah, that's why I will do it as an exercise. And, and I just want the players to understand why we need to make changes. And... A year ago when we talked, you know, you were setting out your plans for the first 100 days and, and, and the fundamental building blocks that need to be changed. You're now a leader going into year two. What's, you know, as you get the players together for the next few weeks, what does your agenda look like for them, for the for the for what you're trying to achieve? Uh, well, the agenda is very much, uh, let's review and reflect on you know, what went well and what didn't go so well and learn the lessons quickly so we don't repeat. Move swiftly into coaching, you know, and, you know, the the uh, the reality is, you know, we've got a uh, five or six week pre-season before the first league game. We then play nine league games on the bounce. So if you think pre-season will start in July, the final is the 20, uh, 20 odd of June next year. So it's 11 month season, 26 games plus Europe on top of that. So, it's a marathon, um, but the first game comes around pretty quickly. So the priority will be the rugby. Let's get let's get the new players integrated. Let's get them up to speed with the game plan. Let's make sure we're fit, we're strong, we're mentally switched on. We understand our frameworks in attack and defence. Um, and as all the players come back, because players come back at different intervals because of international tour or whatever, um, then we will um, use use the period towards the end of pre-season to talk about that culture, identity, leadership piece. Um, I've touched, I will touch on it next week and I'll talk about the performance clock, um, but the priority will be on field coaching rugby. Let's get up to speed. Um, and by bringing in more experienced players, you know, Roman Tuff, who is a very experienced, you know, French international, for example, uh, Owen Farrell, hundred odd caps for England. You know, you've got, you've got some really good um, leaders coming in. So then it's just deciding, right, who's in the leadership group. Um, I'm probably going to spread the leadership uh, responsibilities. So maybe set up a, uh, a family group who, who uh, are tasked with looking after the family, a social leaders group who are tasked with developing um, social cohesion within the group, you know, barbecues or whatever. Um, uh, so things like that to, to spread the leadership. I have a core group of senior players who, who I would call my, you know, right-hand men. And when you went through that five match losing streak, I remember we talked to the previous uh, one of the previous podcasts about how you empower the players more to take ownership of the game plan. And your comment at the time was it worked, it worked really well, but you couldn't rely on that the whole time at every game. Talk about that balance with your leadership team about direction and support versus empower. Because again, for a lot of business leaders, that will resonate. How much do you give them a free hand? Do you point them and you let them off and trust them? But how much versus how much do you still need to be guiding to a certain extent? 
Yeah, yeah. I guess I guess business is very similar to a top fourteen season in that it's a twelve month. You know, you don't get yeah. <laughs> you don't get breaks, do you? You don't get off. <laughs> um so oh, it's quite it's quite in august yeah <laughs> <laughs> so yeah so we we um we went through that period and i'd say i empowered them i sort of forced it was forced empowerment yeah by by saying i want you guys to deliver on you know the key players for toulon we were playing at the time um how you think the game plan is going to work what what uh what's our scrum strategy what's our lineup strategy you know we obviously we were guiding them but they were presenting which meant they had to take more ownership um, and it, we achieved what we wanted to achieve. I, we won the game. We had a break afterwards. Um, and with this particular group of players, uh, and this might be true in business as well, um, it it was very hard for them to sustain that level of off-field commitment as well as the on-field commitment, week in, week out. You know, the preparation that it takes to 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 analyse opposition and everything else. You might say, well, that's their job, and it is their job, but that's the difference between... A player that's an international player and a player that's not played international rugby. And it, the reality was we have four or five international players out of 45, not 17 like Leinster have. Yeah. Um, or Toulouse have. So so I was trying to really push hard um, that. But equally, there were times where I would have to uh, lead directively myself. Um which I, which I did, um, but which I did, but also there was a time, one particular game I remember, where uh, as much as I tried to lead and try to emotionally connect the players to to the vision for the game, for the motivation for the game, they just couldn't find it inside themselves to do it. And we were very poor on that day. And it was a home game, actually. Um, and that was probably the lowest point of the season for me when... when uh, like I was thinking, God, how do I get more out of this group? You know, um, when they couldn't go to the well anymore. Um, uh, fortunately, in a bizarre way, that defeat actually gave them the internal motivation to not let that happen again. And we, you know, we went on an upward, upward run from there. But um, it was a low point because I remember in the change before the game. You know, I was giving uh, what I felt was a really clear direction and I think I looked at them and they looked engaged and motivated but the performance didn't reflect that um, and one of the things I think in my first year that I would say I don't think again this is true in business but like the way in which we uh, our quality of training improved then we had this dip during the Six Nations where confidence was lost but I could see the quality of training improving towards the end of the season but sometimes it wouldn't translate into into the match and that's the step we need to take in this second year. You know, we need to be able to deliver under pressure during those 80 minutes because as a coach, that's it. You know, you can take them to the to the to the to the line, but you you need you need the players to to, to take take themselves over that line and, and deliver. And uh um and that's the step we need to take this year. Yeah, um, I again when I was looking back in our first um podcast you were talking about the ideal time split between, you know, it had been a while since you were the head coach. Uh, you wanted to spend most of your time on the pitch, you know, togged out, yeah. training uh, the team. And and yet, you know, I do get a sense as we've talked over the few uh, episodes, um, there's an awful lot more to be head coach than you rec- remembered in terms of the demands. Uh, talk about that, as a kind of as been the CEO, how you allocated, you know, how, how you wanted to spend your time versus how you ended up spending your time. And is there a fix there somewhere that you in in season two you can get the balance a bit better the way you like to do it? Yeah, I think I think I think um recruitment, retention, decision making on who stays, who goes, out of contract player, um uh, discussions with the player, discussions with the agent. A uh, player leaves, you decide not to offer him a contract. How do you keep them motivated when there's another four months of the season to go? Who replaces them? You know, how do we get Owen Farrell to sign? Do I have to, you know, we meet him and we make him an offer? And, um, you know, all, all that stuff is, you know, at a club like uh, Leinster, for example, you have two out the top and two young lads come in the bottom and you might sign one overseas player. At uh, Racing in France, it was like completely the... Opposite, do you know what I mean? Like very, very um, volatile is the wrong word, but very, very uh, unstable. Um, and you know, it was the 
it was the end of the, the life cycle for the, the old team. Yep. But there were players that, that were under contract. So they weren't going, you know, in my first year. But obviously, as they retired, four massive players retired with, I don't know, I'm going to say over a thousand caps between wow. the wrestling caps. So huge, huge players have finished. Um, so yeah, that that was very consuming, um, and that definitely ate into uh, my coaching remained consistent, but my my commitment to the job, um, the hours I was putting in, just grew, just grew um, to a point where when you've gone July and now you're in April, May, June, and you're still you're up at five o'clock, you're trying to go to the gym, um, you go to the gym between five and six, you start at six, you get home at six, and every weekend is a big game and there's big pressure, you know. Uh, it was it was tough, like it's a tough job. Um, uh, and I don't regret, obviously, doing it, but if someone said to me at the end of the year, how, how was the job? I'd say, yeah, it was, that was tough. That was a tough year. You know, and I've done like different jobs and, you know, yeah. from Leinster to England and academy jobs and jobs in the championship and jobs in the premiership. Um, but I put this right up there in year one as like challenging. In terms of the demands on you as an, as a person. The demand, yeah, it's exactly. The demands, yeah. It took me to the limits in lots of ways of um, trying to, the communication, obviously we've talked about the leadership piece of trying to steer a, a ship in an upward direction by making changes at the same time. The management uh, challenges, the uh, the coaching challenges of winning games against big teams or dealing with defeat. Um, trying to give the players the reason why we lost and solutions to problems and having one for ones and get the best out of people. Manage staff. Staff were changing. Um, yeah, there was it was it was a lot. It was a lot to deal with um, in 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 the first year for sure. Now, business leaders listening to this will say, okay, it sounds like Stuart needs to delegate more. <laughs> or, you know, and we, we've all faced that job, uh, position as a leader where you say, no, no, I, I, I'm the best person to do this. I'm the best person to do that. I need to do this. I need to do that. If I look at the football model, sometimes they have director of football and he deals with all the transfers in and transfers out negotiations. From the experience you've had over the last 12 months, are all the constituent parts of the job things you need to do? Or could you stand back and say, hang on a second, in terms of value add, why am I doing this? Why am I doing it? Do you get the opportunity to, to perhaps delegate some of the things that you've done yeah, over the last? Yeah, no, I did, I did to be fair. And I do I do trust um, uh, the assistant coaches. You know, they would do, you know, their coaching element of, of, of the week. They would do the, the pre-match team talk sometimes. You know, we'd all... You know, present at different times in the week. Um, uh, you know, I don't have to have my hand on every negotiation with every player because the president, Lauren Travers, would do that. Um, so, so yeah, you know, obviously there is an element of delegation for sure. Um, but ultimately, I could get another coaching, um, and then I could probably stand back. But then I'd stop coaching. Yeah, which uh, you don't want to do. Which I don't want to do. <laughs> So it's it's a bit of an arm wrestle in my head. <laughs> um, some good people out there, and there's some great people who who come in and and help. Um, but 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 ultimately, um, I feel year one was um, a huge transitional year for the club. You can see yeah. that by the number of players going and players coming in. Um, I'm I'm hopeful now. I'm a year down the line. You know, I won't feel you know as uh, stretched at the end of year two. Um, than I did at the end of uh, um, year one. Um, but we'll see. We'll see. You know, it's... Uh, uh, it, when you mentioned the football model, actually, I read Carlo Ancelotti's book um, oh. in the holidays, uh, Quiet Leadership. And he, I, I, when I was reading it, I really felt um, French rugby is very, very similar to football with the ownership model, you know. So he was at, I don't know, PSG, Real Madrid, and then he went to Chelsea and had a Bromwich, you know, and... And it's it's a very very similar dynamic, you know. The owner, you know, has has a view on performance, um, and uh, um, there's a lot of dynamics, you know, going to different countries, dealing with um, a team of um, people speaking different languages. Um, so I found it a really interesting read, um, and I found myself thinking, 
you know, this is what it feels like to me. You know, it feels like I'm in a, you know, a football, European football environment. And you're famous for kind of writing down things you've learned. Anything that you took out of the book that, um, kind of think that may cause you to pause? Well, he, he said, he said, ironically, learn the language. <laughs> um, <laughs> he speaks four languages, I think. Or I something. Know, yeah. um, uh, learn the language, um, manage up effectively. Okay. Um, and again, I think probably in hindsight, I allowed the language barrier to affect that uh, relationship. Because normally, like when I was at the RFU, I would um, schedule regular meetings with the board of the RFU. You know, I'd make sure I would speak to the chairman and the CEO, you know, on a consistent basis, keep everyone updated to the direction we're going. Um, what I found this year was that obviously it was a busy job, but, um, you know, my relationship would be with the president, Lauren Travers, who would then communicate through to the owner, Jackie Lorenzetti. Um, and, um, uh, but that meant that Jackie obviously had, was one, one place removed and obviously with him not speaking great, um, English mean, but speaking great French, um, you know, I probably didn't, um, spend as much time, uh, catching up with him and his wife and giving them, uh, an update about what we're doing and where we're going. Um, obviously they were welcome to every meeting I ran and, you know, but obviously they're busy people. So it was only towards the end of the year that I uh, we had a meal together with an interpreter and everything else. And it allowed me to really give a sort of um, my perspective and balance over what I felt or where I felt we were and where we're going. So that's one example, you know, that Ancelotti had said. Um, he, you know, he would talk about um, the different personalities within a team. So when he was at Chelsea, he had a strong English contingent, but equally... He had uh, overseas players. When he's at PSG, you know, it's completely different dealing in a French environment and the French mentality versus at Chelsea, you know. So I found myself nodding my head thinking, yeah, it is it is different. And, you know, it's 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 making sure you you buy into the cultural aspect of the country that you're working in, um, but not be dominated by it so you don't bring your own personality and your own ideas. And it's a really, really fine balance. Interesting. Yeah. Because, it, because, you know, we've signed... Um, some new players, some are French players, but also we've got three um, three English players coming in, and I don't, you know, I don't want people to feel I'm turning Racing into an English team. You know, that's the last thing I want to do. You know, it's very much a Racing team. Um, uh, but equally, I know that value for money, these these guys will bring, you know, will bring something that will help the team improve. Um, so yeah, it's it's a it's a really, I mean, if I ever do write a book. There's going to be a big chapter uh, on this period of my career. Um, yeah. I, I mean, I spoke to Johnny not so long ago, Johnny Sexton, and Johnny was at Racing for two years. That's right. Yeah. Uh, and uh, obviously, you know, I saw Rog during the season at La Rochelle. Um, I saw you know, players I've coached, Jack Knowles at La Rochelle, I chat with him. You know, so the different players that I've coached along the way who are in the top 14 now. Uh, and coaches are in the top 14. Paul Gustad's at Stade Francais. Yeah. So I had a beer with him and, you know, so it's nice to be able to sort of share share stories and share ideas about what works and what doesn't. Um, and Johnny, Johnny, you know, would would be the first to admit that, you know, it was a challenge for him as a player as it, as it is for me. But, you know, you've got to, they've got to know that you, they've got to know your personality first, I think, in France. They've got to know they're happy for you to to motivate or, or not criticize, but like help improve them. If they know you you're a good person, you've got your you've got the club at heart, and that you're a good person. And I think you know, even though I couldn't speak the language, I think the players picked up on that quite quickly. And I've tried to be, you know, um, as relaxed as I can be, you know, in front of them, so they see the real me. Uh, and I think that um, you know the feedback I've had from your French-based players, so you're obviously checking, like, are you happy with the direction we're going? You're Gil Ficus, Nolan Legare, Henry Chavonsi, Cameron Walkie, you know, the big, big French personalities. Um, and, uh, you know, I give them the chance to, to, to give me feedback, but they feel, uh, I feel they're happy. Obviously, they're disappointed we're not winning as well, um, or yeah. we didn't win. But um, uh, I get the sense we're, we're going in the right direction. And I feel like, but I'm going to see them for pre-season. I'm I'm looking forward to rekindling the relationships. You know, I like I like the team. I like the players. I like the people. I like the club. Um, I just want to do well. You know, 
And it, I want to do well in a really tough environment where you've got, I don't know, the likes of Toulouse, who are who are the standard bearers of Europe. And, you know, salary cap wise, I've got another two million because of the way in which the cap works and which is, you know, it's a four quality players. So um so yeah, but uh uh it's a uh, it's an interesting uh job. It's an interesting job for sure. Well, and just to go back there a bit, because so and I, I know business people will kind of reflect on this as well. The first year you do a new job where you're the top man or the leader of division or whatever, you do go to every bun fight, every dog fight. You want to know how everything works. The trick then is in year two to probably understand, well, you know, that is less important than this. And and But it sounds like you if it ends up in the same demands this year, that would not be a good thing. For, that would be failure for you if you're if you're stretched as much as you were in the last 12 months yeah something's yeah. not right yeah yeah but equally yeah for sure but equally like you've got nine games on the bounce going into november and every one of those games is difficult yeah there's not like it's not like you play castaway and it's easy or you play i don't know bordeaux at yeah. home and it's easy or then you've got la rochelle or then you've got claremont you know these aren't yeah, yeah, give his easy, easy games. Um, um, and um, we've got also this situation whereby our uh, our our home Paris Le de France Arena um, is um, being used for the Olympics, which is a great ah. privilege for the club. Um, but it's now a swimming pool. <laughs> um, <laughs> so we're playing we're playing our home games, our first probably six home games at a place called Cretay, which is twenty yes. minutes from the training ground. But it's a it's a football, yes. football stadium, you know what I mean. So that's sort of like we're we're moving here, we're moving there, we're playing here, we're playing there. Um, it's part of the dynamic of being a racing, yeah. racing um, coach or a player. Um, so it's just a, there's other little like challenges along the way. Um, so yeah, I'm hoping that year two, um, you know, we're I don't know, we're getting to the end of the season. We're on round twenty six. I'm not trying to qualify for the top six with four minutes to go oh. <laughs> <laughs> praying we get the conversion but but my respect for the competition and the other teams in the competition is such that i know every point counts and it isn't going to be easy yeah. it isn't gonna be easy because that's why the top 40 and there's, there's only more quality players coming in every team you know it's it's a it's a tough league you were said saying in a previous podcast you hadn't had as many defeats since you were at Leeds, I think like twenty five years ago, uh, it's uh, which is clearly a, you understand now that that you know it's not about winning every game; it's about hopefully winning your home games, getting a few points away, getting your team into a position. Uh, and, and that's the challenge is that, that we you know we didn't have a great home record. Ironically, yeah. that's definitely something that needs to be addressed this year. You know, so. Our defence improved, you know, lots of the metrics you'd say have improved, but um, with that period of five games as well, we didn't pick up any bonus points. And, you know, when when you consider that the best team in the competition lost nine games. Yeah. Um, uh, and, you know, Bordeaux, who came third, lost 11 out of 26. That's the yeah. team that came third. Um, so, it gives you an so idea, what, you know, of the demand. So what does what does success look like in year two? Uh, I would say uh, a great, for me, if it, if it was obviously success in terms of league table, in terms of Europe is is um, more, a lot more consistency home and away. Um, uh, a, you know, we're not scraping into the top six. We're comfortably in the top six at the end of the season. You know, we're into the latter stages of the European Cup competition. Um, um, so that would look like success from a you know, metrics point of view, but in yeah. terms of like, for me, it's 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 improving the quality of the squad, so recruiting you know better and better players for this year and for next year, and, and obviously that's an ongoing process. It's improving the quality of how we train and how we coach the players, and then that trans. More importantly, the translation of the things we're doing on the training field into games for a consistent, on a consistent basis, uh, both home and away. Um, so the consistency and the real, uh, it's not say, I'm saying it's a French thing, but definitely a a real inconsistency in mental application for 80 minutes, you know, concentration when the ball moves away or, you know, when the ball gets turned over. Um, 
so working hard in that sort of mental mental skills space um uh growing the depth in the squad improving the quality of the academy improving the quality of the young players coming through to make it better depth for the seniors team you know they're all they're all important um but ultimately you know in france you get judged by results uh, as well as any team does really um and uh so that will be the metric but it's it's definitely the translation of you know what we're doing um in terms of best practice our standards translating those into games on a consistent basis because that's what we where we were lacking last year in the in the pre-season you had a good win on the road in one of the early pre-season games and you were trying to use that to build um confidence i suppose uh it still seems like there's a role to travel on the mental resilience and and do you have a mental skills coach or is that something that's shared between the coaching team or yeah i'd, I'd say we do there is a psychologist that's just been appointed um, and she's just getting started really um but uh, i would say i did a lot of the the psychology you know with the assistant coaches um i'm wanting to going back to the player leadership piece do a, do more work and i'm actually just in the process of organizing it now um some psychometric profiling to get the players to understand their own personalities and share those with um their colleagues you know so they understand each other better so for example we've got camille shatters the hooker and um, baptiste shuzanu who's our main lineup call has just left uh, to go to bayon and cameron walkie is now a you know a main lineup call behind um baptiste shuzanu and and those two, you know, have only really worked together for two years. You know, you know, you wouldn't have the same synergy as someone you worked together for five years. And Owen Farrell has worked, you know, will be working four weeks before the first game. You know, he's had what 15, 16 years at Saracens, and you know, he's played against Gil Fuku, but never with him. Yeah. Uh, Josh Stewart's over. So so all those linkages and all those relationships um are, are critical in making a team cohesive. Um, and the more they can understand each other better as people, the better we'll be as a as a team. And so I'm so that's definitely something I'm going to try and um, develop, um, so that there is more ownership by the players um, because they understand their own person is about a bit, and they can they can manage the demands of competitive rugby week in week out um, and still lead. You're really starting to get into the tunnel now. You're into pre season. You're you know the the tunnel is focusing. Did you get a break over recent weeks, sir? Yeah, yeah, no. What, I, does, I, a, what does the got, Lancaster got, family holiday look like? We got, we got the, uh, we finished the Bordeaux game. You know, the the week was to yeah. deal with what we talked about, um, and then I went back. Actually, we drove back to the UK. Um, I went um, back to the farm to see my mum, um, and uh, uh, went back to the house in Leeds, which had sat empty, and that was a mile post this big, and um you know things falling down and broken or whatever else um so did that for a week and then we went uh to club of santa in lanzarote which is like a sports complex which is really nice my son uh and then nino and i flew from there to estepona yeah uh, spain and then flew back to paris and back to it um so yeah lots of time to reflect i read i reread my old sort of go-to books um Ancelotti's book was a really good read. Um, uh, the Power of Regret, I read, um, uh, about how learning from failure, you know, can help you um, and also not having regrets, obviously. Um, so, yeah, there's lots of different books I read. Uh, a lot of time just, you know, you're just playing things over in your mind about why did I do this and or why did I behave here and how can I improve this for next year? And so there's a lot of that. Um, going on, but also just the chance to mentally unwind as well, you know. Um, do, do you get that chance? I mean... Yeah, yeah no, I do, I do. Yeah, I'm pretty good, really. Um, uh, I felt uh, the the constant getting up at five, you know, yeah, going, 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 you know, physically, you know, a bit of sleep debt, catching up on sleep yeah, a bit, okay. uh, and feeling... So I feel obviously a lot better now. Um uh watching international rugby obviously there's a great chunk of international rugby to to delve into without the pressure of worrying about the result for myself but can you watch us can you watch it as a, a uh, yeah no i mean i mean obviously you know i'm slightly um biased to the players i've coached so yeah. england you know, ireland you know watching ireland you know beat south africa in the second test was was brilliant you know but even watching 
some of the younger lads in England um, uh, and, and Steve Borthwick and, you know, their, their sort of games against New Zealand were, were really good to watch. Um, so, yeah, no, I, you know, I enjoyed that period. France obviously had games as well. We had yeah. players from Racing play for France. Um, so, yeah, it was good to watch them. Uh, uh, yeah, so, yeah, no, it's, it was it was great. It was great. Um, the reality is the big difference between club coach and international coach. In international coaching, you've got 10 games a year. In, in, yeah. in a club environment, you've got 30-odd plus. Um, and Steve uh, Borthwick won't see the players again until November, effectively, yeah, yeah. November, you know, so... It's uh, the the pre well you've done both. You prefer I always get a sense you prefer club rugby in the sense of yeah, yeah, but I think if you just said to me at the end uh, of the season, <laughs> ten games a year or thirty, I'd be like, hmm, I might, <laughs> I might just go back to the ten version if there's a chance in the future. But uh, um, no, I really, I really, uh, you know, committed for four years. I really um, believe believe in the decision that I've done, and I really want to make it work because I feel if I can. Uh, make it work in such a hard league and in the environment that I've um, stepped into and, and the challenges that have been along the way. If I can, um, with everyone's help, make it work, it, I really think I'll get a deep sense of satisfaction at the end of my career to have take myself way out of my comfort zone, like way out of my comfort zone and put myself in a really difficult environment and trying to to make it work. Um, so, um, you know, again, you read Ancelotti's book and... He gets sacked from about five different clubs, but he's still winning the European Cup. I don't know how many times. You know what I mean? Yeah. His ability to bounce from one club to another to another, you know, his resilience is amazing. But like, um, uh, so yeah, if I achieve half of what he's achieved, then I'll be I'll be happy. <laughs> the last question for you, just uh, as as you get into the the zone for the next season, are you excited? Are you? Is there an element of trepidation? What's what's your sense? Like a fan will always be excited at the start of the season because you know all the possibilities are there ahead of you. But as a coach, been through what you've been through for the last twelve months, describe your emotions as you. Yeah, no, no, I'm I'm, I'm excited. I'm excited because I feel that we've signed, like in the backs, for example, we've signed players who are experienced who are good decision makers who are good communicators who are good organizers who have got good temperament and skill sets and you know we've got the likes of Josh Tuasova available you know and Gil Fico has had a six-week break which he's never had you know Nolan Gary yeah. was injured at the end of the season our first choice to come half our key player was missing at the end you know and he's had his short operation he's fight, you know, fighting fit and ready to go so um and then in the forwards, you know, we suffered because we we didn't have a sort of hugely powerful pack and we've signed bigger, better players, albeit our tight head, we signed Demba Bamba from Lyon, um, who was the big sign. Yes. Did his ACL in the last oh. uh, France game about uh, three weeks ago. Oh. So you sort of sit there and you're like, oh, because because... In the system in France, you know, you, you you've got a salary cap, and you, there's no concession in the salary cap for a player that's injured on national duty. So, if no you, medical joker signing. Oh, well, you can get a medical joker, but you can only spend what's left in the cap. You can't use use his double money. count. Yeah, you can buy a replacement. You've got to, you've just got to deal with it. Um, so you need a bit of luck. You definitely need a bit of luck. Um, and that was unlucky. And same with it, Josh Tuzov last year. You know, his ACL was unlucky, but. Um, it is what it is. I can't. Uh, I can't control that. Um, but I'm excited. Yeah, no, I'm looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to coaching and seeing everyone, getting the players, um, and seeing where we can go. Definitely. Well, let's hope that that optimism and positivity will last throughout the coming months. Stuart, as ever, it's great to chat to you.